Uh, we are glad that you're part of us today once again. So we'd like to start today's session with a keynote address um, from one of our leaders in the world of geospatial technology. I'll just like uh, I'll just give a brief um, introduction to the speaker. Honorable Dr. Wilbur Otichilo is uh, the member of parliament for a parliament uh, of Emuhaya constituency in Kenya. He has a PhD in environmental science. He was first elected to parliament in 2008 and re-elected once again in 2013. Uh, before he joined politics, he had uh, the following um, positions. From 2000 to 2008, he was the director general for a regional center for mapping uh, of resources for development, which is a UN Economic Commission for Africa affiliated institution that promotes the use of geoinformation technologies in sustainable development of countries in Eastern and Southern Africa. 1994 to 1998, uh, he was the deputy director uh, or chief scientist with the Kenya Wildlife Service responsible for wildlife research and planning. 1989 to 1993, he was a remote sensing specialist for the UN uh, FAO IGAD project on the remote sensing component of the early warning system uh, on food security for the Greater Horn of Africa. And before that, uh, he was the chief ecologist with the Department of Resources Service, Resource Service and Remote Sensing within the Ministry of Planning, and that's the Republic of Kenya. As a member of parliament, he's been a part of the following uh, committees and caucuses. Committee on Education, Science and Technology, Committee on Environment, Water and Natural Resources, the chair of the Parliamentary Network on Renewable Energy and Climate Change, and the co-chair for the Parliamentary Network on Environmental and Wildlife Conservation. <coughs> Since joining Parliament, he has moved numerous uh, motions and bills on education, science, and technology. The latest motion being um, the latest motion and bill uh, being on promotion of renewable energy and climate change, respectively. He consulted widely for various UN bodies and international agencies and NGOs, and has published numerous papers in international journals and magazines. And with that, uh, I welcome uh, the Honorable Dr. Wilbur Otichilo. Thank you. Good morning. First, I want to say I'm very delighted uh, to be here this morning, uh, to be with you, and share my experiences in these very important emerging technologies that are driving the world economy today. As you have heard from my previous um, engagements, I've been involved in this technology probably more than anybody in this house except one. <laughs> Professor Nuere is the one we have been working with for many, many years. So I would say it's very nice to be here and share our experiences with you. I hope since you started this conference, we have had a lot of um, <coughs> you know, presentations on this subject. And this morning, I want to give you the actual application of it. As you have heard, I'm now a member of parliament for the last seven, uh, nine years. So I'm not as savvy as you are. In, in this technology, although I am, you know, abreast with it on what is happening. Um, but I can say 
that I continue to use it as a major tool in my daily work in the constituency and even in parliament when I'm preparing my presentations and motions. So this morning I decided uh, to look at the, the entire subject which embraces earth observation because it is the acquisition of information that we require for planning. And then the tools that we need and that's why GIS becomes a major tool or platform to do that. And then about from GIS we have a number of allied GeoICT technologies that are extremely important for us to uh, undertake a comprehensive uh, planning process. Uh, this presentation has been prepared by my, myself, my office. I have my officer here, uh, Orlando Washington, uh, who is working in my constituency as a GIS officer. So we prepared this paper with him, with another friend of mine and student by the name Eric Hamala, who is now running his own company called Located Limited. We have worked with him on a number of programs uh, in my constituency. My presentation outline will be introduction, which basically I have done. Uh, we would like to look at the trends and opportunities that are there in earth observation, GIS, and allied <coughs> GeoICT technologies. And then briefly just look at uh, Kenya today. And then specifically, I'm interested to zero in in my constituency. The thrust of this pre uh, presentation is to show you how you can use this technology. Because when you read many papers in this field, you will find a lot of theory about the technology, the development of the technology. But the application is always very scanty. So I would like to show you what you can do at a grassroots level, uh, dealing with the women and men who are not um, technicians, who are not um, savvy in ICT, but who can use maps to be able to make decisions. First, let's look at, we are in Africa and um, most of us here are Africans. Leadership. Why do, we, do people go into leadership? You may ask me, why did I go to leadership? Uh, if you, you had my CV, it was very, uh, very, you know, uh, lucrative. Why did I leave those big jobs to come to leadership? In leadership, we are looking for solutions. We are looking for solutions to better the welfare of our societies. We are striving every day to solve problems. And there are very many problems on education, on health, on business, and everything. So basically, we are, uh, in our daily lives, we are trying to look for solutions. So leadership is about looking for solutions. And to be able to get these solutions, you need information. Because without information, you cannot make rational decision making. And as most of us, you are aware, in Africa, most decisions are not based on information. They are based on people's um, desires and where they come from. 
Normally leaders, if you come from your village, you want the best school to be built in your village. You want the best health center to be built in your village, regardless whether there is another one or not. So we need information. We have to change this practice so that decisions are driven by information. And I think that's all what we are striving to do. So today we have a lot of technologies which were not there that can enable us access to information very rapidly, more than just ever happened before. We have the Earth observation, we have so many satellites in space that are providing information continuously. And with time, most of this information has become readily available. Actually, quite a lot of it for free. So most of the information you can now access to most of the information you want anywhere for free. When I started doing GIS and, um, and um, remote sensing, to get even a hard copy, imagery was a nightmare. We had to, 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 to order it and wait for four, five months. But today, if I want any imagery, I can get it. At Google, if I want to find my direction, I just get on my laptop and I do it. So things have changed very fast. And then the most important, the other related ICT technologies. Internet is readily now available, virtually, in this country, almost everywhere now. So again, these are technologies that now allow you to access to information in real time. So I've already said that you need information for planning and for us who are in leadership for policy and decision support. To be able to do that, people must sit down and analyze the information in a more rational manner. And this is a culture that we are trying to build in Africa, but we have a long way to go. And I hope most of you, when I look at most of you, you are all young people. I believe when you step on our shoes as leaders, this, what I'm giving to you today, will be a normal practice. But today, most of the leaders we have, and most of you are Kenyans, you know most of our leaders cannot get to this level even to understand how to use information for decision making. So what we need in development is to have initiatives that transform life. Those initiatives, most cases, are development initiatives. So in our endeavor to better our lives, we have to undertake a number of initiatives to improve. And these initiatives are projects, our programs and so on and to start a project or a program you need information for justification even if it's coming for funding like most of us who do who would do a lot of uh, project proposal for donor funding you know what it means you have to prepare and so and uh, give justification And the most important thing, and this is one thing I want to stress, it's important that when you undertake any project, that project must have an impact to the society, must change the lives of the people. It is pointless to undertake a project that has no impact on the people's lives. So as you undertake projects in your countries, in your homes, in everywhere, the first thing you must ask yourself, what impact is this project going? Is it going to make the lives of people better than what it is now? If it doesn't have impact, then please don't waste your time, 
and money. Do something else. In creating impact, we have developed three eyes framework. And this we have developed with um, my good friend Eric Kamala, who runs the Located. Three eyes that are so important in any project formulation. The first eye is information. If you don't have information on anything, then there's nothing you can do. So in anything you attempt to do, you must first starting point is information before you do anything else. Once you have the information, that information can then inform you or you can use that information. And when I talk about information, uh, data is part of the information. That information and data can now inform you to propose or formulate an initiative or a project which will then address that concern. So once you have the initiatives, and that's when I go, once you have an formulated an initiative, the final, the ultimate aim of the initiative is to have an impact. So whatever initiative you are coming up with at whatever level, even at the household level, it must have an impact at that household level or at the national level. So impacts are very, very, very important. So in this three eyes framework, you can move around, you can come from information, initiatives, impacts, and refined back. I think the whole week you have been here, you have gone through the current trends and opportunities in earth observation, GIS, and geo uh, ICT. So I'll not spend a lot of time in that. But you are already aware that we have so many opportunities now. Uh, we have the Copernicus program, the SAFIR uh, program, which is actually run uh, globally. Uh, we have the Landsat program. Uh, we have the International Charter on Space and Major Disasters. All this data is readily available. You don't have to uh, buy it. You only access to it. So this getting the information that we said is the starting point is already available. So you have no excuse to say that I need information. During our time with the Professor Nyuere, we used to have a lot of excuses. We, we, we can't access to this information. It's nowhere. But for you now, this information is readily available to you. For example, this, just, this is the Sentinel, Sentinel um, data, which is also readily available. We just checked it on the internet and picked Africa. And now we said, let's come from all the Africa to Kisumu. This data is readily available to you. So we have said, let's go where Kisumu is and pick some of the rural areas that uh, you may be interested in. And I've just picked an area just um, east of this place, uh, which is called Mikosi, Kibose area, which grows sugar cane. It's just uh, 10 minutes drive from here. You can access this data readily available. And it's a 10 meter resolution data, which can be able to be, help you to create a lot of information. Uh, during our earlier time, we used to use Landsat, whose resolution was 30 meters, which was even more difficult. But you can see in this, we can look at the farms 
and so on and so on. So this data is readily, uh, readily available. We have looked at now QuickBird, which is now even the more refined data, we have, which has a resolution of um, one meter. So we have zoomed all the way from uh, all over the world to where we are in this building. So this is where we are. So you can see, you can get to your village by just sitting yourself. So currently now using the QuickBird, which again has become, okay, still in the commercial um, arena, but these high resolution data sets are now very cheap compared to what it was, particularly if you buy the archive data. It's very, very cheap. And for me uh, and my constituency, we have been buying this data, uh, which is already in the archive, and uh, we have been able to use it very well to reach to a level where we map up to household level. And I think my GIS uh, officer is here, uh, Washington, Orlando, can tell you, we know everybody in Emuhaya. We know what you have on your farm. Everywhere, we know. So you cannot cheat us. We know. Because we have, we have access to this data. And we buy it uh, at a very subsidized, almost 30% uh, of the total cost, once it is in archive. The other, the other uh, um, technology that has made a big, big difference for data collection is the handheld GPS system. With the GPS system now, you can collect any form of data wherever you are. So now we've come from the satellites, now you are the observer yourself. So with the GPS, handheld GPS, again during our earlier time when I was working on the GPSs, they were very expensive. Today a handheld GPS is, is not very expensive. With a good, with let's say $500, you have a very good GPS, which would give you a data to a precision of about two to three meters which is good. So you can collect all the information. So again, at the, our constituency level, my GIS officer, what he does every day is to collect information on whatever we are interested in every day. And this data is relayed directly from where he is to, to, to our, uh, our cloud cover, uh, uh, server, where I can access to it at any time. So I don't have to call him. If I want information, I'm in Nairobi, he will be, I can communicate with him as he gets the data is relaying to me. I'm looking at it and we, so everything's just as simple as that. Even our normal phones, which we already have, all of you have phones here, I'm sure. There's none of you who doesn't have a phone. Those phones, smartphones, you can now use them to collect all this information and relay it as fast as possible. So the technology has improved so much from the time when I was a student in the US and I had a privilege to work with Doug, Jack Dengerman in, in Redlands for almost three months. We were on a standalone computer. You sat down on the computer. But with the time, we now have improved to a coordinated uh, GIS system. We moved to the cooperative system. And now we have moved to cloud. So now you can basically access access to information wherever you are. So you can see how technology has improved, moved. And this has improved, moved just um, in the last 30 years. So, what I've spent talking in the last uh, probably 10 or 15 minutes, what we are saying is that technologies are becoming better, increasingly affordable, and convincingly reliable. 
and Africa is progressively taking advantage as it too proudly champions some. And in Africa, now we are championing quite a lot of initiatives in technology. And I think Kenya is one good country that has championed a lot in technology. Um, the MPESA technology, Ushahidi technology, when we had all the, the post-election violence, how information was relayed to the rest of the world in real time. So Africa is picking up and we have no excuse now to say that uh, we are not there. We should be there. So let's look now, get now from Kenya to where I, I, we are today in Kenya in terms of GI, geo-information. To have geo-information as a country, you need legal framework. Because without a legal framework, you cannot. So I want to show you that in Kenya, we made a major, major stride in putting the legal framework to allow geo-information uh, be a major platform on which development should thrive. On the legal pillar, we have in our constitution, those of you who are Kenyans, you can go and check, Article 10 of our constitution um, envisages public participation in all planning decisions, decision-making processes, and good governance. So that Article 10 has said, for any program or initiative in this country, you cannot study it without the involvement of the people. The people must be involved. So that gives you a legal framework. Whatever you do, you are uh, covered legally. We have gone further and enacted a law, which I think I must say I contributed immensely to this uh, law, the County Government Act, because now we have a, devolu a, a, a devolved government system. And in this law is what is implementing the public participation at the county level. And in this law, we have put a GIS database as a major platform for integrated planning. We are in the process of finalizing our space policy, Kenya space policy is ready. It's only that the executive has been sleeping on the job. I must say this. There's nobody, there's nobody who can do anything to me because we have given them the policy, we have done everything, but they have just failed to implement it. In Kenya, we have a department called Department of Resource Surveys and Remote Sensing, which has been uh, uh, very, very, very crucial in... Um, uh, promoting uh, geo-information. In Kenya here, we have a lot of institutions that are now dealing with GIS, remote sensing, and so on, in the public sector and in the private sector. And that's why we have Esri East Africa here in Kenya running, I mean, promoting uh, GIS in the entire uh, East African region. And finally, um, in this country, we have ICT policy, which has really seen the transformation of ICT in this country. And that is a, a government initiative which has ensured that ICT is readily available everywhere and, if any, uh, anything, uh, affordable. So we have a quite a number of legal frameworks which probably I don't want to go into because of the time frame. But um, I would want to say that one of the key issues which has made um, a major improvement in this country is what is called Constituency Development Fund or popularly known as CDF in this country. 
This is the first initiative to devolve development from the national government to the local people. And this initiative has seen a major transformation in development in this country. And this is where leaders or elected members of parliament have played an over, oversight role. And most of you Kenyans, you know, this initiative has been a promoter and a killer to most members of parliament. Most members of parliament who have misused this fund when it comes to election, most of them are taken home. They never come back. So again, the use of geo-information on, uh, on how to use these funds has been very crucial uh, in this country. So let's get to, now I've come back away from Kenya. Now I'm taking you back. Emuhaya is not far away from here. It's just about 25 kilometers northwest of this place where we are now, along uh, Kisumu Busia Highway. So let's get to Emhaya, where now I am the member of parliament. Those are the details about my constituency. It's located in Viga County, which is just not far away from here. Uh, we have even the, put the constituency in the wards for ease of administration. So I have three wards, West Bunyore, Central Bunyore, North East Bunyore. The coverage is there. Uh, when we did the election, when we did the, the census 2009, uh, 2009, we had 95,000 people. But with a population growth of about 3%, we're estimating we are about now 120, 130 there. Our main activity is agriculture. And I have represented that constituency since 2008. So let's look at our experience as regards to how have you used Earth Observation? How have you used GIS? How have you used uh, GeoICT technologies to do the three eyes that uh, we, we, I talked earlier about earlier? So at the constituency level, you also need a basis for development. And the basis of our development is that you must involve the people. So the first thing I had to do as an elected member of parliament, had, I had to sit down with the people of Emuhaya and ask them what is it that they require uh, to improve their welfare. So we ended up preparing what is, what is known as a Muhaya Constituency Strategic Plan. And because this was the first plan we were doing, we found out that whatever people wanted, we could not do it in five years, I was going to be the member of parliament. So we decided we would do a 10-year strategic <coughs> plan and implement it in two phases. So this was the first process, to sit down and find out using now information what is it that you want to do to set up the initiatives so after that after the strategic plan was prepared we had to set up a gis ict center which will now host the what we called constituency um a development information system we didn't even call it gis because it's information that anybody can access to. Also, we needed to ensure that this information is accurate, is reliable, and identifies priority community projects so that people can identify with themselves with the projects. And basically, in any community in Kenya, in Uganda, in Tanzania, you go anywhere, the first thing people take you, tell you is about education, health, water, energy. Environment is now that is coming, but before there was no environment. Then security. So those are the key issues that uh, were identified in my constituency. 
So once we identified those sectors, we are now to collect information on them. For example, on education, we had to do an inventory of all our education facilities in the, in the constituency and document their current, their status by then, by either primary schools, secondary school, tertiary schools, and so on. We had to map the facilities. We had to map the information or get information on the teachers, on student enrollment, location and everything you can think of, so that that informed what then we would use to derive initiatives. For example, if we found school A has dilapidated buildings, then the first initiative is to build new buildings or renovate them. So this was an exercise that was done in-house, but also with the help of the community. Because every time um, uh, Washington goes to any school, any health center, he will talk with the administration of the place. We have the assistant chiefs, we have the chiefs, we have the local headmen. You have to go and talk to them and formulate these projects with the stakeholders uh, playing the major role. So let's look at um, briefly education. There are many things we have done. I wish we had planned earlier. You should have visited our constituency, but unfortunately we didn't plan this because you would have seen most of these things yourself. But let's look at the education, what we've been able to do, just giving you examples. So we have come up with maps which are available in digital and hard copy. Our major people, our stakeholders, may not use the computer. So we have produced hard copies for them in a compendium. So when they come on education, they can look at the maps and should be shown where they are, where the schools are, and so on. And as with the high resolution data, people, you'll be amazed how common man or woman, once you give her a map and she identifies her home, she will find the homes of every other person. Very easily. Even when they have never gone to school at all, they will find it. So it's amazing that, you know, people can, uh, once you show them where, what, something they know. For example, we started with the churches. We tell them, look, we want to take you where the church where you go every day. And once they see the church, then she would see all the neighbors. She would tell you this one so's home, this one so's home. So it's easy. They don't need to have to go to school to know. It's just like mobile telephony. When it came, it's only the elite who could use it. But today, even the most illiterate person in the village has a mobile and knows how to use it. Anybody, if you know anybody who doesn't know how to use a mobile in this country, tell me. Even most people have never gone to school, who have never gone, but they look at the mobile and they know. You press this thing here, you get this. You press here, you get this. You press here, you get this. Even the MPSA now, if you go to my biggest market, it's called Rwanda. It's just across here. Women now transact business on a mobile. You never see them handling money anymore. So what I'm just saying is that this technology, which is so, looks so complex, you introduce the ordinary person, as long as he or she understands it, will just become like a normal thing. So we, with this, we derived so many, uh, a lot of statistics, like let's say we have statistics on primary schools, number of pupils, number of male and uh, uh, male, female students, all these number of teachers. So we have all this information. So when it comes for looking for a teacher, posting of a teacher, we are in a position to tell the education officer, this is the school that requires the teacher. Because unfortunately in this country, teachers <coughs> are just posted. 
depending. If you go to the Teachers Service Commission and you talk to them well and you are influential like me, they'll give you a teacher. And they don't care, they will not know where even you are taking the teacher. They will just tell you, yeah, I want this school to have a teacher. But some of the schools in this country are over, overpopulated with teachers because of the, of the influence of the, of, of the members of parliament or who is. Or if there is a, a, a posting teacher, a teacher who, is a, who, is a, a, who comes from that village and is working with the TSC, has populated the teachers in his schools. Most of them, you go there, they are just seated, uh, just talking. But you go to the next school where there is a no influential person, you only find the two teachers. So we have produced this information to ensure that we can give it out and tell them, look, this is where we need to put the teacher. And you don't have to be influential to have the teacher go there. So we, we do this, we do bar, uh, bar charts so that people can look at it in a very simpler manner. Um, we have um, statistics on, let's say, facilities, uh, what facilities we have. Uh, we have even gone to a level in this country, most of you Kenyans know, that is land grabbing. And people grab public land, and schools uh, have public land which has never been registered. So for us, we have gone a step further to ensure that all the schools their land is registered, so that it's not stolen by land grabbers. So we have looked at which land is not, which schools are not being registered. We go out and look for money to register, to ensure that we have saved that land for public forever. Otherwise, people just come around and say, this land used to belong to my grandfather, I'm taking it back. And then they take it. So we have produced all these maps for all the sectors, from health to education, uh, to road infrastructure, everything. And they are there in hard copy, and we have made some of these in big, so that we put them on the board just the way we have displayed here. So that people, when they come, we can show them directly. So, uh, for example, that's just a facility there. We are looking at the uh, public education facility by building. So that's, let's look what, what is in that area. So for example, when we did analysis, we wanted to build a school and we found in this area there was no school. So we used uh, our, our high resolution data to show that this is an area where we wanted a school. But you can see there was nothing. What is there is only the church. So we acquired land. And after acquiring land, now with the help of the people, and we now started to construct. So if you look, you can see now we have constructed a block there for children. And then we've been doing that. Now you can see the place is transforming. It's changing completely. The, there was the church, now we put the school. This is what it was initially, when the people started. But this is what we have been able to do. We put up a new block with the people, not ourselves alone. And now this is how the school looks like. And this process has only taken just about uh, four, four years. So you can see what it means when you involve people in the whole process, in the decision making. This is another place. There was another place where we wanted to put also a secondary school. If you check there, you see there is nothing. But people said they wanted a high school. So we have well, they wanted a project called Ebonangwe High School. So again, land was identified. That's the land that was identified, the black one. Then it was agreed that we put the school. So you can see the school. This school, we just put it up. Actually, we opened it this year in January. So again, you can see the process of acquisition of the land and then people involved. 
And then as we're building that, you can see even houses for the teachers. So electricity is very important because energy drives development. So again, in our constituency, we said we must have electricity everywhere. So again, this one project that we are, we are backed on. So again, we mapped all the facilities where electricity was, where the grid lines were, everywhere. And then we identified areas that lacked electricity. And we worked in collaboration with the Kenya Power and the Kenya Rural Elect Elect Electrification Program to put up electricity everywhere. So in 2004, July, we mapped out areas that didn't have electricity and areas that had electricity. That was 2004. And working with the, the company and so on, uh, in um, 2000, August 2005, we had covered the whole place. Uh, yeah. So now, as far as I know, everywhere in Emohaya, there is electricity. There's no way. Anybody who just doesn't want, who doesn't want, who, who has no electricity simply because it's not connected. But now we have now program with the current government, which I must congratulate, which they called it last mile. So those people who didn't have money to connect, now they are being connected free. So as I'm saying now, basically everybody uh, has, has power. And we, under the last mile, people now are connecting power. In fact, I was just writing a letter, a letter yesterday to the cabinet secretary in, in charge of energy, showing him them places where the people have not connected because they are poor, they don't have money. So again, on school, we a community, community said they don't want children to walk more than one kilometer to school because we don't have buses. People want, want children to walk less than one kilometer. So again, that was a decision that was made by the community. So we also said, how do we access to uh, schools? So we had to do analysis of the available schools and do the, your normal buffering to ensure, to see where the one, one kilometer is, radius is on every school, to identify areas where we needed schools to fulfill the requirement of the people. So again, if you look on this map, you will see areas which didn't fulfill that criteria. So it was our responsibility as a leader of the, of, the, of the constituency and my team to show people that these are the areas that don't meet your criteria. So if you have to build schools, these are the areas where you have to build schools. So we've, we identified areas where we needed the schools to be built. But as we go on, you discover there, were, there are other physical factors which informed schools not to be built in those areas. But let's move on and see. So we, have, we identified the ones in, in purple is where the schools are, and the areas where we have the buffering, that's where we, we, we needed the schools. So we found out that area we needed a school because it doesn't meet the criteria. So that band in between, again, we put uh, our high resolution data as our background. So basically we can identify the homes of everybody and say this is so and so's home and, and they can tell us yes it's true our children walk this distance. So we identify the area and talk to all these people. Then eventually we ask them as a priority where would you want the first school be built because we have identified the need but now People have to sit down and decide. And decision is informed by many factors. The first factor is, is, it there, is there available of land? So the availability of land also det determines who, where do you start with? 
where. So again, we identify that area. Okay, I think we seem to have gone. Okay. Okay, so the people, after sitting down and identifying where the land is, people identified one place where there was land and we could build a school. And they decided they wanted to, to start with a place called Ebucheli. So they said we will start with a primary school there called Ebucheli Primary School. One of the major criteria was that land was readily available by the community. And the community was willing to give the land to the school. So that's where we started. There was no school. So we built the school. If you check that, the CDF uh, funded project, we started, we did this in 2014. So this is uh, a project that we just did uh, two years ago. So, then we went to another place. Again, that we identified that we should have a school. But when we looked on the database, we found out that there was a reason why there was no school there. That place is a wetland. So that's why we couldn't build a school there, because it's a wetland. You can't build in a wetland. On the health, people decided that people should not walk to a health facility two kilometers. The maximum they should do is two kilometers. So again, we had to look at the health facilities we have. So we mapped all our health facilities. Those of you who remember the previous map, uh, the other one on the end there, you can see there is a wetland. Uh, that's why we couldn't build a school there. So again, health, we mapped all the health facilities. And from there, uh, we identified places where we need uh, more uh, facilities that need maternity and so on and so on. So again, with the buffering, we were able to identify as areas that required um, to be built to build more health facilities. So those are our health facilities. So you can, you can see areas that require or are, are not covered if we use the criteria of two kilometers. So we again overlaid it on the highway resolution uh, satellite data so that we could identify the gaps. And again, when we did the gaps, you can see up there in the north, we found we needed to put a health center right on the top there, on the eastern part, and on southwest. So we identified areas that we needed to uh, construct. So we found out that the area one on the north, the place called a Cerulo dispensary, you can see construction. We had ju we just completed the construction uh, a few months ago, and uh, we also identified one called a Sabas dispensary in the south, which is just about to be completed, and so on. So after construction, this is what we put up. And it's now, as I'm talking now, it's complete. Uh, it's ready for, for use. Some of the areas, we've just um, purchased land and uh, we are in the process of building. Then again, we can look at the road network. Again, we have done quite a lot on road network. So we mapped all the roads in the entire constituency and classified them according to the conditions. So you know which road is and with its condition. Whether it's moderate during rain season or not, you will know. So you don't have to say you didn't know. And that's why you went with your car and you got stuck. You should be able to know that 
This road, if you go, you you get stuck. Okay, I'm just about to finish. I know, I know. Yeah. So what I've indicated there is now what we are planning now to put a tarmac road so that the tarmac road can, can cut the constituents into two and therefore that would make our constituents have a ring road of tarmac. So again, we can show you how the road network was. This was 2001 when there was actually no road network. 2014, you can see the roads as we have developed. 2016, you can see how we have improved the road network. <coughs> Again, you can look at that, uh, specific areas. We have zoomed in into specific areas. That was 2014, that's 2016. You can see how we have improved the road no network. Uh, this is another area. This 2001, there was only one road. But now, just check uh, 2014. You can see the roads we have put. We have even tarmacked that road, the major road that was there. And 2016, you can see how many roads have come. Security, I said, is very important. So again, we have mapped all our security facilities. All those mapped in red are our police posts or what we call AP camps. So again, we wanted to make sure that people, when they have a problem, they can access to security very fast. So again, we have a map there. You know where to go. If you have a problem, you can run to the police very quickly. We did also buffering and so on to ensure that at least we know where, which areas require police stations. Agriculture, we have done the same. We have actually, we are the only country, uh, constituents in the country that have um, a radio station to give information to the local people about agriculture and the activities. So this radio station was opened uh, early um, in March last year by the Minister for uh, Local Government, what is called the Climate Resource Center to provide information on climate. That's our radio station and the offices where the local people come to meet and to know the climate change because so they will be able to inform to what the, the status, how the rains are going to behave and what type of crops they should, should plant during that season. We have a med station, a fully fledged med station which gives them information every day so they, they know what 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 is required so we have this data is relayed directly to kenya met station in nairobi for also uh, for the archiving and to incorporate it in the non normal uh, weather uh, stations of the country agriculture the small scale so we also use NOAA satellite da NOAA, uh, data to monitor growth of crops. So we monitor our, uh, the, the, the performance of our crops using the NOAA, NOAA data, the, the vegetation index data. So we can be able to tell the season, whether it's going to be a good season or a poor season or a normal season. So we do this. This data is readily available on the, on the internet. We do communication because communication is very important. Uh, you can do all these things, but if you don't tell people what you are doing, people will not know. So, as I said, uh, we have a radio station, which we use every day to communicate to people what we are doing. We print all these strategic plans. We produce a newsletter every, every quarter of the month, every quarter for the people to know what they are, we are doing. Uh, we have also opened a GIS ICT center, which is run by my young man there. Uh, it was officially opened by Honorable Fred Matiangi. He was then the Minister for Information, uh, Communication and Technology. We opened it officially uh, on 16th February 2016. 
2015. So we have a fully fledged um, a GIS ICT center. This center provides information uh, free for everybody who comes there. This is when we were opening the center. These are the people, if you see in the background, you can see the satellite uh, data that I have just been showing you, which people use to identify any of the issues. We have prepared compendiums so that people can read these things in a more simplified manner. All these maps I've shown you, we have made it on just small sheets, which people can just carry with and go with it at home. So we only put we mainly recommendation is what most people are interested in. So we have all this compendium, which people can use very easily. So you know, you can have the information, but if you don't disseminate it, it's also a problem. So let me just finish by saying what are the valuable, uh, valuable lessons we have learned. There are many lessons we have learned. Uh, you need a strong anchorage or you need a champion. For this thing to happen, it cannot happen out of the blues. You need a champion. So a champion of this on anything is very important. You need a leadership that is focused. Uh, you need uh, institutional capacity. Uh, you need linkages, you need coordination. Uh, you need to impress things like public-private partnerships. Because I have worked with, the, for example, with the Located as, as, as our GIS uh, company that we work with and they advise us on many things that we may need. So what we have learned is that you need a lot. I will not go into this but um, I've just uh, said a few of them. Uh, monitoring and evaluation system is so important. You must monitor and evaluate what you are doing. So that was a Muhaya before I got in. And when I got in, you can see it changed. Fine. That's the end. <laughs>